Hey there, folks. This is the OU Insider YouTube channel, and this is Quick Slants. Typically, midweek, I, Parker Thune, along with Jesse Crittenden, uh, we're, we're breaking down a Brent Venables press conference, all of the main storylines, all of the notable quotes, observations from the Sooners head coach. Well, we didn't have a press conference with Brent Venables this week. That's because the Sooners are heading into a bye. And Jesse, on the heels of what was such an emotional victory over Texas in the Cotton Bowl, really not sure this bye, for many reasons, could be much more well-timed for Oklahoma. Yeah, no kidding. And we we talked, we did get to talk to to Brent and some players yesterday, and that was the sentiment. And it was pretty interesting to hear from Brent. Like, yes, there needs to be a an emphasis on not getting complacent. There needs to be an emphasis on on not taking their foot off the gas. But I think everybody in that locker room is saying the same thing that that was, that was an incredibly emotional win. It was physically draining. It was mentally draining, not to mention the injuries that OU suffered. Uh, Cause Parker, the reality is that wasn't just a regular, that wasn't just an OU Texas game. It wasn't just an o a regular OU win. That was genuinely one of the more, I think, just taxing wins for everything it means for this season, for everything it means going forward, for everything that it means big picture under Brent Venables. It's one of the biggest wins, I think, of the last 10 or 15 years for this program. So yeah, I think this bye week comes at a at a really, at a really good time. And I think what this win signals and emphasizes is that this is a program in year two under Venables that has turned the corner. Now I don't think we entirely know what that means yet. Does that mean turn to the corner back to big 12 championship contention? Obviously. Is that the ceiling? Does that mean turn to the corner back into the national championship conversation? I, I think the jury's still out on this one. Obviously that was an encouraging victory, but what is objective after Saturday, Jesse is that more specifically this Oklahoma defense has turned the corner and you could see that most notably and most conspicuously on the goal line stand early in the fourth quarter. No kid. I genuinely, Parker, I think you were probably just like me. You were on the field for it. Once Texas got to the one yard line, it wasn't just that they got to the one yard line. It was how they got there. Just big play, chunk play after chunk play. I thought, well, they're going to score on the first yep. play. That's what we see. That's what we've seen from OU defenses. I knew, I know this defense has improved from a year ago, but that's just who thought, not only was was OU going to make a stand, but that you know that it was Texas was going to have four tries from inside the one and not score. I think that I think that goal line stand from a single game as, aspect in a game you win by four points that's huge. But I think from a proving the first five weeks and the improvement that we've seen, proving the direction that Brent Venables is taking this program, it's one of the biggest uh, sequences from an OU defense in this rivalry game for quite some time. And Parker, I was genuinely stunned. I was genuinely stunned that OU got the stop. Now, you don't want to make a mountain out of a molehill, but it, it, it is the case, Jesse, that historically this game and the outcome therein sets the tone for the remainder of the season for both of these programs. And so as we look at Oklahoma's last offensive drive, a drive that will live on in the annals of Red River history, the Sooners go 75 yards in five plays. Dylan Gabriel caps it off with a three-yard touchdown pass to Nick Anderson. But as we look at the way that that drive unfolded and the determination, the willpower, the level-headedness, and the resolve in the face of a ton of adversity, they started that drive on their own 25-yard line with no timeouts in a minute 17, and they were on the burnt orange half of the Cotton Bowl when that drive started. Dylan Gabriel and that offense they were completely undeterred, marched right on down the field. Again, five plays, technically a sixth snap if you want to count the pass interference penalty that was called against Terrence Brooks as he guarded Nick Anderson. But looking back on that drive, Jesse, how much confidence do you think that instills going forward for this offensive unit, a moment like that? Well, and that was one of the questions I asked a couple of players at availability yesterday. And I, the, the takeaway for me is Dylan Gabriel was incredible on that drive, obviously was incredible. It wasn't just the touchdown to Nick Anderson. It was the plays he made before that. It was the throws to Drake Stoops, the throw to Jalil Farouk. But I think the thing to me is as great as Dylan Gabriel was, it wasn't just him. You saw guys 
all across that offense make big plays. Uh, whether it's Caden Green, a freshman, playing in easily the biggest possession of his career, whether it's on that touchdown to Nick Anderson. I mean, Nick Anderson obviously caught it, but it's Walter Rouse blocking two guys. It's Tawi Walker picking up a key block in in pass protection at Drake Stoops making those plays. I think it's I think it's just the idea that in a hostile environment in a game where the second the second half offense wasn't very good, Parker. It wasn't like they came into that last drive with a bunch of momentum. I think for them to kind of jumpstart their own momentum in a hostile environment in a huge game in a drive they had to have to see so many guys step up and make plays. Yeah. And I think when you look forward to what is left on this schedule, I'm not saying oh you can't be tested, but how how likely is it that they're going to be tested more than they were in that moment? Absolutely. Likely. Absolutely. That's a, again, about as daunting of a circumstance as Oklahoma will likely face all things considered for the remainder of the regular season. And I thought it was interesting. Uh, we got the chance to catch up with Danny Stutzman yesterday uh, after Monday's practice. And the question to Stutzman was a question that uh, we'd asked several players and members of the coaching staff immediately after Saturday's game as well. It's okay. How do you make sure that going into the bye week on the emotional high of the Texas win that you don't allow yourselves to get complacent? And here's what Stutzman had to say. Yeah, you know, I think with Coach Venables, we don't have that problem at all. You know, he's a really down to earth guy. You know, I think right now we're kind of taking away from the bat of the game, you know, fixing it, improving upon it. So we're ready for UCF. Now, again, Jesse, I think coming out of this by, this is where we're going to be able to distinguish between the new Oklahoma and the old Oklahoma, because it's pretty undeniable that the Oklahoma Sooners of yesteryear, for instance, if faced with an emotional high going into a bye week, an opportunity to, get a little bit lackadaisical presented itself. Well, I you hate to say it was going to happen for that football team, but you at the very least, I, I don't know if you necessarily expected it, but it was a legitimate concern. How much does it concern you with this team in 2023? It, it doesn't really, Parker. And I think because of everything that OU, that win against Texas represents, I think this is a program that all of a sudden – the shift goes to, well, why can't OU, why why can't this team make it to the Big 12 title game? Why can't they make it to the playoff? But I think they also still feel like they've got a chip on their shoulder. I think that six and seven season a year ago is still on the minds of everybody on this team. And to hear Brent Venables talk about it, it's this bye week brings some much needed rest. You know, they you know, they even did a service project um, today for, for foster kids in Oklahoma. Um, you know, there's, there's going to be some non-football activities, but I think you heard everybody from Key Lawrence to Danny Stutzman to Walter Rouse um, to Caden Green to Key Lawrence to Brent Venables himself talk about how important this bye week is to recover because there are going to be challenges in the next few weeks. And that's even what Brent Venables said is there are going to be like the second half of the schedule community, like as a whole is going to be harder than the first half was and I think it's not only about preparing for that but I think it's acknowledging that this team has goals half you know we're halfway through this season the goals that are ahead for this team last year's team just simply didn't have they were four and three going into last year's bye it's just a completely set of circ a different set of circumstances for a completely different team I asked Ethan Downs on Saturday what this defense proved in the Cotton Bowl and then I asked Billy Bowman what Dylan Gabriel proved in the Cotton Bowl. Here are those two answers. And we're real competitive, and we're out here for all of it, just like all every team is, you know. Um, so it's it's what we expected. We're here. Dylan improved that he he can do it all, whether that's the deep ball, that's the intermediate routes, or running with his legs. I think he had 100 plus rushing yards today, which was which was big time. So uh, I think he proved that he's a complete quarterback. As we look ahead, Jesse, to the finishing kick for Oklahoma, Brent Venables himself said it Monday, and it is objectively true. The back half of this schedule is going to be a tougher road to navigate than the front half of this schedule, top to bottom. How much of the Sooners, well, I mean, let's, I, I don't think it's, I don't think talking about the playoff hopes at this point, I, I don't think that's out of pocket because the Sooners are number five in the nation. And so I, I think the question, deserves to be asked how much of the Sooners playoff hopes at this point looking ahead rest on Dylan Gabriel and how much of it rests on this defense 
Yeah, I think it's, and I think that's part of why Saturday was such a confidence booster. It was as, as incredible as that last drive was by Dylan Gabriel. Uh, the defense had to make plays and do things to even have the offense in that position to be able to go win the game. But then it was also reaffirming for Dylan Gabriel to be able to perform like that and what was easily the biggest game of his career. But I think the reality is, as good as the defense has been at a lot of points this season and as much as the offense is, is, has been good, I don't think this is a team where the offense can play really, really bad and expect the defense to bail them out and vice versa. I think this is truly a team, you know, compared to what we saw, you know, under the last administration where the offense needed to score 50 points and it kind of didn't matter what the defense did. This is a different team where I think you need both sides of the ball to make plays to take care of business like I think this team expects to. So I think it's you're hoping that that performance, you know, is is just a continuation for Dylan Gabriel of what we've seen this year. And I think you hope the same thing for the defense, because for this team to accomplish its goals, it's going to be not either Dylan Gabriel playing well or the defense playing well. It's got to be both. And it's got to be both in concert. And I think what you have seen from Oklahoma to this point in the year is that they're capable of win winning a number of different styles of football games. For instance, you look at the defensive slugfest against Cincinnati. Sooners got that one done. It was never really in doubt. They ran away from Iowa State, hung half a hundred on them. Again, that game was never really in doubt. And then they go blow for blow down the stretch with Texas, the most talented opponent that they will face all year, at least in the regular season. And they come out on the winning end as well. So again, it's just the diversity of ways in which this team can go and win has impressed me and is certainly a marked contrast from the Oklahoma teams uh, that we have watched in recent years. And certainly you look at the former OU staff out there at USC right now, they have one blueprint for winning and one blueprint only. And any deviation from that blueprint puts that program in an alarming situation. That isn't the case for Oklahoma. And they enter the bye week as the number five team in the nation, Jesse. What do you what do you feel is the threshold down the stretch? What do you feel Oklahoma needs to accomplish at this point in order to live up to expectations that no doubt have been adjusted for a lot of people based on the outcome of the Red River rivalry game? Well, I think defensively, it's continuing the trends that we've seen through the first six weeks. And that was what was really encouraging to me about Saturday is everything that's been good for this defense, third down defense, third, you know, third down efficiency, red zone defense, uh, takeaways, all of those things were on display in the biggest game of the season. That's the kind of stuff you want to see continue. And I think offensively, what I want to see is I think we're kind of accepting that, you know, I think Tali Walker is, it needs to be the number one running back moving forward, but this is not going to be a running offense that I, is going to run over everybody uh, every game. I think Dylan Gabriel's involvement in the running game needs to continue. But then the other question is how do the Sooners deal with the absence of Andrew Anthony, who, uh, who was leading the team and receiving through six weeks. Now I think the the good part is that this wide receiver position group is deep enough to I think to mitigate some of that loss but it is going to be a change so I think it's not only going to be uh relying on some younger guys but I do think that means more on Dylan Gabriel's shoulders so what both as a passer and as a rusher so I think there are things like that that you that you want to see from this team things that they're going to need to do moving forward so who do you think uh as we put a wrap on this installment of quick slants. Who do you think is going to emerge primarily as the shoe filler, if you will, for Andrew Anthony, as he's now lost for the season? Well, I think the easy answer is Nick Anderson, um, a guy who, I mean, we've seen the talent on display. It's not just the game winning touchdown against Texas. He leads this team in receiving touchdowns on the year with six. All of those have come. Uh, in the last four games. But Parker, the reality is Nick, Nick Anderson needed more snaps than what he was getting anyways. He actually no wasn't see, he wasn't seeing the field a ton um, even over the last four weeks. So I think the bump in snaps that are going to be coming his way um, is going to is not only necessary. I think it's been necessary the whole time, but I think that's it's going to make him a bigger part of the offense. Um, so I think that's the easy answer. But to me, I think this also means more Jalil Farouk. I think we're finally we've finally seen a couple of performances here in the last three weeks. I mean, he led the team in receiving 
um, against, against Texas. He had 130 yards. So, I mean, while Nick Anderson, maybe we see a little bit more Jaden Gibson, um, you know, maybe, maybe we see a little bit of LV Bunkley Shelton or even someone like Brendan Thompson. I think the reality is Nick Anderson is going to be the biggest beneficiary, but I think yeah. Jalil Farouk is going to be the one that we see this team rely a little bit more, uh, on down the stretch. Well, if you're looking to replace Andrell Anthony one for one, uh, First off, I don't think that's something that you can do, at least not in an exactly congruous sense. I think Nick Anderson is the closest thing that you have to Andrew Anthony right now in this receiving core if you're just trying to do the one for one replacement. But I also think what Nick or I'm sorry, what Andrew Anthony offered while he was healthy, you know, he was a guy who could stretch the field. He was also a guy that could go up and get 50 50 balls downfield. And the best, most capable field stretcher on Oklahoma's roster at this point with Andrell now out of the picture would be Brennan Thompson. But Brennan Thompson is five foot 10, 160 pounds. He's not going to be able to go up and come down with jump balls the way that you expected Andrell Anthony to because he's four inches shorter and doesn't have the same leaping ability. You know, Brennan Thompson uh, has speed on speed on speed, maybe the fastest player on the team, but. Uh, you're not going to be able to have as much margin for error on those throws downfield because he doesn't have the frame and the length of a guy like Anthony to go up and moss a wide receiver. So I think in that sense, uh, you almost have to replace him in the aggregate between Thompson, Nick Anderson, and also Jaden Gibson. Uh, I think he's poised to see his role expand with Anthony on the shelf because talk about a guy that can go win jump balls. That's Jaden Gibson, and you've seen it on several occasions thus far this season. But he's only got six catches. And again, hadn't gotten a ton of snaps, all things considered. He's made snaps count when he has gotten opportunities. Uh, but those opportunities, I do believe, are poised to increase uh, for him, for Thompson, as well as for Nick Anderson in the aftermath of Andrell Anthony's loss. That's it for this week's installment of Quick, quick Slants. Excuse me, Quick Slants. Sometimes my tongue moves faster than my brain, Jesse. That is Jesse Crittenden. I am Parker Thune. If you haven't subscribed to this YouTube channel, please do so. Trust me. Uh, you want all uh, inside of every single manner on Oklahoma football and recruiting. This is the place to be. Our man Brian Clinton has dropped some outstanding film analysis lately in his Field Vision series. We're going to have you covered throughout the week with the Under the Visor podcast, the Oklahoma Drill podcast and much, much more. So hit that subscribe button. And if you want to jump on board at OUinsider.com and get all the juice on the stuff that we can't talk about on this side of the paywall, go over there right now to the Rivals Network, OUinsider.com. Sign up for an annual subscription today with promo code RRSWIN. That's RRSWIN, all caps and you will get 50% off your annual subscription. That is less than $5 per month to get the most and the best OU football and recruiting information that you will find on the internet. We'll see you next time on OU Insider.